Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to CIB Day. My name is Richard Francella. I'm a manager of public affairs here at the CIB. And today I will be introducing our speakers and serve as a moderator for today's session. If you have questions at any time, you can answer, enter them into the Q&A box at the top of your screen, and we'll address as many as possible following the presentation. We'll also be providing some helpful links using the chat function. Uh, so please keep an eye on that today. If you would prefer to experience today's, fresh in, today's session in French or another language, we are using live real-time automated audio translation and transcripts. And you can access that using the Wordly link or the QR code in the chat. Si vous préférez assister à la séance aujourd'hui en français ou dans une autre langue, un système de traduction audio et de transcription automatique est en place. Vous pouvez y accéder en utilisant le lien Wordly ou le code QR dans le chat. Finally, today's session is being recorded. So let's get started. I'd like to introduce our speakers. Joining us today, we have Brian Riley, Senior Director of Investments and Lead on Public Transit Investments. Alex Ryan, Director of Investments and is a lead on our Infrastructure for Housing Initiative. And joining us virtually is Hilary Thatcher, Managing Director of Indigenous and Northern Investments. I will now turn it over to Brian to begin today's presentation. Great, thank you, Richard. Um, and as Richard said, I'm a senior director on the investments team where I focus on uh, the public transit sector. Uh, but before I dive into public transit, I thought I would just give a brief overview of where the uh, the CIB is today with, with respect to our investments and partnerships. So um, if you could go to the next slide. So as of March uh, 31st, we've uh, committed over $13 billion, committed and invested over $13 billion to over 70 projects um, that represent $36 billion in total total CapEx. So, you know, we're making really significant investments in projects across Canada. And as you can see on the map, the, these projects are truly across Canada, uh, which is a great thing to see. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this slide shows a snapshot of a few of the the investments we've done, by all means, not all of them, but I like this slide because it really uh, demonstrates the variety of uh, investments that we've done and the diversity in, in our approach. So it, ranging from, you know, billion dollar investments in large scale transit projects serving urban environment in Montreal down to, you know, a $6.4 million investment in a wastewater treatment plant serving a, a small indigenous community. So this really demonstrates that we're we're here not just for urban urban projects or, or or one type of infrastructure. We're really trying to serve the infrastructure needs of, of all Canadians. Uh, next slide, please. So on the transit side, we've we've invested 14, uh, we've partnered with 14 uh, uh, different regions and made 14 different investments in the transit space. And and what we're trying to do with, with transit is really focus on uh, Improving the the transit the public transit options that are available to commit to Canadians to to give them cleaner and faster options to get where they need to go. Uh, we work with public transit agencies on expanding and improving their transit networks, things like building new subway systems or LRTs, all with the aim of getting people out of their cars and, and onto public transit. Uh, we also work with oh no sorry back. we also work with uh, transit agencies to. Uh, electrify their fleets. So when they're looking to replace their existing, you know, largely diesel emitting uh, buses, as an example, uh, and they have the option of, of, of going for a green, green, more environmentally friendly option. Um, unfortunately, those all often cost a lot more money. So we have financing options available to help with that. Um, and lastly, we focus on uh, not just traditional forms of transit, but alternative forms of transit as well. So things like aerial transit and um, and ferries. So they're not options that are that make sense in all situations, but they certainly uh, have their place and have the potential to uh, allow transit agencies to broaden their, their reach, uh, often at a, a cost in a cost effective manner. So if you saw on the last slide, there was uh, you know a number of our partnerships are for zero emission buses, and this is a program that has proven to be quite uh, quite popular since it was launched. Um, with this, uh, with th with this initiative, we're really, um, you know, helping transit agencies and, and other bus owners with uh, overcome some of the issues with uh, 
with purchasing zero emission buses. So, you know, a typical diesel bus has a lifespan of 10 to 20 years. Uh, when a bus owner is looking to replace it, they could either go with an existing or go with a, a diesel bus or go with a, a zero emission bus. Uh, you know, a zero emission bus has the obvious benefits that it's it's more environmentally friendly. And, you know, in addition to that, it should be cheaper to operate from, you know, uh, both a fueling cost perspective and a maintenance cost perspective. Uh, the downside is that they are quite a lot quite a bit more expensive than a diesel bus. So particularly when you add in the charging infrastructure, uh, going from a zero uh, diesel bus to a, a zero emission bus can be uh, as much, if not more than, than twice as much. Um, so the CIB can, uh, can provide a financing option to bus owners to, to help offset this cost. And with the repayment of our, our financing coming from those cost savings. So with this program, we're really eliminating the cost uh, cost question from um, the bus owner's choice and really allowing them to focus on how they can implement and integrate zero emission buses into their, uh, into their fleets. And as I said, this program has been quite successful. We've uh, committed over $1.5 billion to zero emission buses and, and looked to help bus owners uh, purchase more than 5,000 uh, buses, uh, zero emission buses uh, over the next few years, both in the transit space and the uh, school space. Uh, next, please. Um, so next few slides, I'm just gonna provide a, a, a brief overview of some of the investments that we, we've made in a little bit more detail. So the first one is, is actually the first investment that the CIB made and it's in the the REM project in, in Montreal. And this is somewhat of a gold standard for how we like to see the private sector uh, being involved in our projects. Um, it's a large scale, as shown on the slide, 67 kilometer light rail system that's under construction. Part of it is in operation in greater Montreal. Um, and you know eventually it will span all of Montreal when it's completed. Um, under this transaction, it, it's fairly unique. The, the Quebec a government partnered with CDPQ, who's a large uh, pension plan uh, in Quebec, uh, to design, build, finance, operate, and maintain the system. Um, so CDPQ is exposed to, to cost overruns, and importantly, its revenue is also uh, tied to the performance of the system. So it's tied to how many people actually uh, use the system when it's uh, when it's put in full operation. So. We think that this uh, this kind of risk transfer to the public or to the private sector really uh, causes a, a good alignment between the the private sector and the public sector, and, and provides for the best chance of, of these kinds of projects being completed um, on time, on budget, and and uh, you know with the the greatest probability of of having people actually use the system. Um, unfortunately, this. This kind of uh, risk transfer is somewhat unique in in Canada, and it's 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 very difficult to find uh, lenders and um, you know even equity investors in some cases who are willing to to take those risks, and that's one of the key benefits that the CIB can can bring to these kinds of transactions. We can um, really share in some of those risks and and, uh, and and fill in the gaps that are preventing these these projects from uh, moving forward, with the goal of uh, also getting private capital invested in. Projects and, and and generating the outcomes that we want to get from these uh, these kinds of transit projects. Um, and you know, as as I mentioned, part of the project is in operation, and it's it's uh, you know with the remainder uh, coming online for in the next couple of years. Next slide. Um, so this this Highland Zebs is a, a an example of our a zero emission bus. Uh, initiative. It's, it's actually a, a unique one in that in most ZEB uh, investments, we partner directly with the, the owner and operator of the buses. Um, and those operators will, will be the ones who are either delivering the transit service or driving the, uh, the kids to and from school. This one is, this is unique in that we're providing financing to Highland, who's a, a leasing company. So basically what their business model is, is they'll, they'll engage with school bus operators who don't necessarily want to have to worry about uh, implementing charging infrastructure, who don't want to have to worry about uh, the cost of electricity or, or the, the cost of maintenance. And that's where Highland comes in. They take, they, they develop the, deploy the charging infrastructure and they take the risk on, on those, those, uh, 
uh, on the electricity prices and maintenance with our with our support. So we, we think this model will be particularly attractive for uh, some of the smaller um, and, and mid-sized bus operators and allow them to focus on their, their core uh, responsibility, which is to get kids to and from school. Um, next. The next example is our investment with BC Ferries. So BC Ferries, um, they're the largest ferry operator in Canada, one of the larger ones in the world, and they, they provide service uh, between Vancouver and, and uh, Vancouver Island in the mainland and also up to, into northern BC. Um, they have a, a, an existing fleet of largely diesel ferries, so they're, they're great at, at transporting people, but they do emit uh, greenhouse gases, and, and BC Ferries is has a uh, ambitious program to electrify their 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 fleet uh, over the over the coming years. Um, key challenge with that is similar to zero emission buses. It costs a lot more to to, to purchase a uh, electrified ferry. So our investment will help uh, you know, neutralize that upfront capital cost and allow BC ferries to uh, move forward with their uh, fleet electrification. So that's just a sampling of the the transit uh, investments uh, that we've made, and with that, I'll I'll hand it over to uh, my colleague uh, Alex Ryan, who will talk about our housing initiative. Thanks, Brian. It's uh, helpful to to follow Brian. I think public transit and transit in general is both an issue that has to be solved in its own right, but it also can be a, a catalyst for new housing development. And as a result, we're going to draw on similar similar examples. Uh, as part of uh, as part of the following slides, um, so CIB, as you may have heard uh, during the this morning session, was provided uh, an updated statement of priorities and accountabilities in September of 2023. Um, that's a letter from our minister Sean Fraser, Canada's Minister of Housing, Infrastructure, and Communities, um, and in that letter, um, it laid out that the CIB does and should continue to invest in infrastructure that enables housing and and uh, and including water wastewater district energy and uh, public transit um, we should work to explore other options in partnership with all levels of government and attract private investment into the space so we were we were given that letter in september of last year and we were asked to respond by december and that was the time period of us developing this new infrastructure for housing initiative. Uh, we responded with our uh, comments back in December of last year. Um, we recognize during this period that it's, there are many elements necessary to increase Canada's housing supply. There's the available, availability of land, there's municipal zoning requirements, there's the availability of uh, construction supply chain, labor and materials, um, there's development financing and making sure that that pencils out, but there's also the requirement for infrastructure capacity to take that land and convert it into service land so it can therefore um, be zoned for new development. So the CIB's focus area is on um, this enablement of new infrastructure capacity, um, which is a, it's a natural fit where, with our existing uh, authorities. Uh, it's an area that we can certainly do more to attract uh, private capital to accelerate um, this development. And uh, the Infrastructure House for Housing Initiative um, really means an increased focus with more flexibility and ability to share risk uh, to encourage municipalities to build more and more quickly. Go to the following slide. So this slide lays out the CIB's priority sectors and kind of frames what's required for uh, new housing development. Um, we're not a housing investor per se, but we're an infrastructure investor, and there are a number of other federal programs that uh, are available um, to support both areas that the CIB uh, invests in, but also the areas that we do not, namely home construction and community infrastructure. Um, as we know, the infrastructure gap um, within all these priority sectors is is pretty large, and as a result, um, our focus will remain within our priority sectors and really applying a, a new lens to, to those sectors. This slide lays out that even though the Infrastructure for Housing Initiative was only created um, recently, 
Um, we have been investing in infrastructure projects which have enabled new housing developments uh, since our inception. So there's um, a couple of projects here, the Port Stellation uh, Wastewater Treatment Plant and the Nisigamek Nishnavik Reserve Extension, um, which are partnerships with indigenous communities um, to help create, amongst other things, uh, new housing development for on-reserve and off-reserve um, for indigenous communities. Um, there's a couple of projects here, the Lulu Island District Energy Company and the Markham District Energy, um, which are partnerships with uh, municipally owned utilities. So um, I mentioned Lulu Island uh, Electricity Com Company and Markham District Energy, they're both wholly owned subsidiaries of municipalities. And uh, we're working together with them to expand their system. And in the case of Lulu Island, which is with the city of Richmond, um, all new buildings have to be connected to that system. And so in order to expect to create the availability of new buildings, you have to expand the existing infrastructure to, to allow for it. We've heard a couple of times already about uh, the REM project. Um, there is a significant amount of development of new housing that has cropped up around um, new REM stations. Uh, and so it's a good example of where an investment in public transit uh, can uh, increase density increase the availability of, of new homes um, on those transit corridors. And so the infrastructure for housing initiative, this is uh, available on the CIB website, just as an overview um, to, to what we're doing. Um, we're working to provide loans alongside private lenders um, for to work with municipalities on their infrastructure uh, where the infrastructure costs uh, exceed $50 million. Um, if, uh, if infrastructure costs are less than $50 million, there still exist um, tools through our Indigenous Community Infrastructure Initiative, which, um, which Hillary will, will talk to um, following these slides. Um, and this really allows the flexibility for municipalities to deliver um, under establishment models. So it could be um, their existing delivery models, or it can be alternative delivery, delivery models. Um, we're allowing the municipality to run its own processes in the delivery of that infrastructure. Um, and so the bullets here lay out some of the key points. We're, we're providing a blended interest rate, which will be better or equal to the borrowing costs of Canada's most highly rated municipalities. Um, that really levels the playing field for small and medium sized municipalities that might have might struggle to access capital at reasonable rates. Um, Product shares and risks relating to the timing of growth um, by having its payments grow as communities grow. And what that means is um, whilst the blended interest rate is, is highly competitive or it's even better than what can be attained elsewhere, um, if the growth doesn't occur as it was originally intended to, the effective interest rate can actually be lower than that still. And so we're sharing in that risk with the municipality as a result. Um, and as was definitely mentioned this morning, this is just one tool which, com which complements a number of existing um, federal and provincial tools um, to assist with new housing growth. So by sharing in this risk, um, it's our intent that we enable municipalities to build infrastructure in advance of growth and take away some of the risk that's associated with passing the cost of that infrastructure onto a potentially growing uh, tax and race rate base. Um, Therefore, not levying that increased cost if that if that uh, community doesn't grow as expected. As I mentioned, better access to credit for lower and lower rates for small municipalities. Um, this is particularly helpful to, to kind of level the playing field. And for those municipalities that do have um, wholly owned subsidiary corporations, development or utility corporations, the financing might be off balance sheet. Um, so CID is an impact investor, and what we've really done through the uh, infrastructure for housing initiative is put a new lens onto existing uh, priority areas um, and instead of investing in uh, for example public transit for the sole purposes of driving down GHG emissions reductions or increasing transit ridership um, this allows us to also invest in those types of projects for the purposes of enabling new housing development to occur within those communities that uh, that the investment is taking place. And in terms of how we're doing it, is, is through sharing in, in that risk with the municipality. 
And finally, there's just uh, one slide here with an example. Um, this is a, a recent investment commitment with uh, with Brandon and the RSR Wastewater Cooperative. These are loans provided to each of those two borrowers, and they were uh, bundled and facilitated by the province of Manitoba. Uh, these projects were also supported by uh, the federal government and the provincial government um, through the existing grant programs, and the CIB provided uh, a loan to each of these each of these two borrowers. The the product. As I mentioned on the previous slide, it shares in the risk of growth happening, and the CIB's return uh, under these loans is linked uh, is linked to the growth. Um, it achieves th these projects uh, achieve a number of outcomes, both those outcomes that relate to water and wastewater, being um, the treatment of uh, water capacity that which meets and exceeds regulatory standards for a household equivalent number of 78,000 housing units. Um, but from the housing side, we're looking at the capacity expansion that this is creating. And these, these projects uh, collectively create the, the capacity for an additional 15,000 new housing units uh, supported by the relevant municipalities, uh, municipal growth plans as well. Uh, I will pass it on to uh, to Hillary to talk about uh, Indigenous infrastructure at the CIB. Thank you, Alex. Um, so my name is Hillary Thatcher and I'm the Managing Director for Indigenous and Northern uh, Infrastructure Investments at the CIB. I've been with the CIB for just over four years um, and uh, I'm pleased to uh, represent uh, as, a, as a, mate, a member of the Métis Nation, but also, um, you know, work with a really dedicated team who are focused on investments in the Arctic and in the territories, along with uh, First Nations and Métis and Inuit communities from coast to coast to coast. Um, so the way we do this is we really do work in collaboration with Indigenous communities. Uh, we are investing really to reduce the infrastructure gap that communities face within their own communities, whether it's an Inuit hamlet, a Métis settlement or community, or a First Nation reserve. Um, and we're looking at other ways to also promote economic participation of Indigenous communities. So that could be through equity investments in major projects that are happening on their traditional territory or the types of partnerships that we're seeing grow across the country, again, from coast to coast to coast. Next slide. We've so far invested in... Um, we launched our Indigenous Community Infrastructure Initiative in 2011, uh, 2021, sorry, and so far have invested just over a half a billion dollars. Um, our target was to invest at least a billion dollars in projects that are in partnership with and for the benefit of Indigenous communities. And so we're at the halfway mark and our pipeline is robust and continues to grow. So far, our projects are impacting 46 uh, Indigenous communities. This is a list of the projects. The other piece that I do want to mention, though, is that the CIB is also really keen to help accelerate projects. And we've done this in a few examples with uh, Indigenous communities. In particular, I'd like to highlight, and you may have heard at an earlier session today, um, and there was a press release today also about the Grays Bay Road and Port, where we're actually making some early investments to help support environmental assessments work and some of the business case around the Grays Bay Road and Port. We've also done this on similar Indigenous and Inuit projects, in particular the Kavalik Hydrofiber Link, and as well with uh, the fixed link to Georgina Island, the Chippewas of Georgina Island in southern Ontario. So we're really proud to be able to help those projects to move a little bit faster through uh, providing some early capital in those projects and uh, to see them uh, move through the, the, the process of design, development, environmental assessment. Some of the recent partnerships, I think you heard from Alex about Port Salashan. This is an incredible project, very small loan size, but it was it's tremendously impactful. And when we're talking about impacts with Indigenous communities, we're often looking at things uh, greater than um, just the impact of having uh, clean or, you know, clean drinking water or, you know, a new wastewater system. We're looking at what that does to the community and we work closely with First Nations, Métis and Inuit communities to understand what those impacts are and often it's around local jobs, it's often around local economic growth and development as is the case of Port Stalashan, which is in the Sea Shelt Nation on the west coast of Canada. 
Uh, we've done and invested in uh, broadband with Aero Technology Group, which is a project owned by in partnership with the Chiefs of Alberta. And that connects a number of First Nations, Métis and non-Indigenous communities in rural and northern Alberta. We've invested in the Beck of Our Wind project with Cowessis First Nation being an, an owner, an equity owner in that project. And again, in Saskatchewan, we've done two urban reserves where we're doing the underlying infrastructure so that those lands can be developed and we can build cultural and uh, other economic development opportunities for the communities at Kakostaha Landing, as well as the Grasswoods um, project, which is owned by English River First Nation. Um, recently, we announced the closing of our investment in the Thompson Regional Airport. This is an airport that was impacted significantly by climate change. Um, the uh, an underlying permafrost was lifting, and so the, the terminal building was sinking into the ground, and a lot of structural issues as well as the, the ground, the runway was having some major challenges. So our investment there is going to enable that airport, which is partly owned by the Indigenous communities and really serves the central part of Nunavut, as well as all of the remote communities as a central service hub for Indigenous people. And so this airport is just such a critical piece of infrastructure for northern Manitoba. As well, um, our most recent and our first investment in Indigenous equity is in the Nova Scotia Energy Storage Project, and where the 13 Mi'kmaq communities will own a part of a um, major uh, energy storage, battery storage project with, alongside Nova Scotia Power. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that towards the end of this presentation. So we have really a couple of ways that we make investments alongside Indigenous communities. One is through the Indigenous Community Infrastructure Initiative, which I mentioned a bit earlier. It was launched in 2021 uh, with a goal really of a uh, target of spending at least a uh, billion dollars in, in projects that are in partnership with and for the benefit of Indigenous communities. We do this by right-sizing our investments. And so, as Alex mentioned, we can make smaller sized investments, anywhere between five and $100 million to really fit the needs and suit the parameters of many Indigenous communities across the country. Um, and we do this across all of the asset classes where CIB makes investments. Uh, you'll likely know that that includes things like clean power, green infrastructure, which is anything from water, wastewater to uh, renewable uh, fuels um, and to building retrofits. Trade and transport, so bridges, roads, rail, ports, airports, broadband, and then public transit. We look at a very flexible source of repayment. So we'll look first to see that the project's going to generate some revenue, but then we can also look to the community to see if they have other sources that they want to assign to the project. Because we know that so many Indigenous communities, especially with community-based projects, have a small population and uh, don't want to add a la layer of extra financial burden on their rate pairs or their members of their community. So we can look to all source, alternative sources of revenue to, to service the debt. Um, the eligibility criteria to in, for, for the CIB to make investments is that, again, it has to be in one of our key priority areas and the project has to be located in Canada. It needs to be revenue generating and we look to, um, you know, replace or upgrade the existing infrastructure or build new infrastructure. So uh, Greenfield is, is a really key place where we make investments. We always look to demonstrate that there is a gap. We're not here to crowd out private capital. We're here to crowd in private capital wherever possible. And so if there is uh, no need for, uh, for the CIB and that private capital is available uh, or there's significant grants available for the project, we'll, you know, we'll help support the community through their negotiations with federal, provincial or territorial governments. Um, but if we, we really do need to see that there's a, a gap in the, in the financial structure. We are, you know, we work closely with communities to identify what those impacts are going to be. Um, and again, it's really to address those uh, infrastructure gaps that so many communities face. Some of you may be aware that the AFN recently came up with a report that suggested that there's about $350 billion of infrastructure gaps um, in First Nations alone. And when you include the 50 uh, Inuit communities across the territories and across Inuit and Nunanat, um, you know, that gap is significantly larger. Um, again, we invest between five uh, and $100 million, and we can cover up to 80% of the capital cost net of grants. And, uh, you know, we're always looking to make sure that the community has an, an economic stake in the projects that, are, that they're building under the Indigenous Community Infrastructure Initiative of 20% equity. Um, 
speaking of equity, um, we launched recently our Indigenous Equity Initiative. And this really came from last year's budget, where the federal government gave the CIB authority to do direct lending to Indigenous communities. Um, in this case, it's a little bit different than a loan guarantee, and some of you might be familiar that this year uh, the federal government announced that it would be launching a, a federal loan guarantee program for up to $5 billion. Under the Indigenous Equity Initiative, we, instead of providing a loan guarantee, we do a direct loan to Indigenous communities. And we do these in projects where the CIB is already involved, and we're seeing this happen. As I mentioned, the Nova Scotia battery storage project, we're seeing it in a large linear assets, we're seeing the interest in ports and trade and transport assets, and we're certainly seeing it in the clean power space, along with clean fuels, um, hydrogen, and, and the like across the country. So in these cases, the CIB can provide a loan directly to the community or communities who have an interest and who are looking at making an equity investment into a project. And we do this through providing the Indigenous community um, and their hold co, if you will, an equity loan so that they can make the investment into the project alongside the public private sector investors. Um, we have quite a rich pipeline of projects. And as I mentioned, the clean power space in particular, we're seeing a lot of interest um, and are actively engaged with regions who are looking at increasing uh, their renewable infrastructure in British Columbia, Saskatchewan, and other regions that are growing their uh, renewable assets. And so we're looking at making those investments alongside um, the private sector and to help support Indigenous communities to access affordable capital so that they can make these investments and earn an economic return. Turn. Economic returns for Indigenous communities typically are focused on improving outcomes for the populations, the Indigenous populations that they represent. So those economic returns get invested in new economic projects, they get invested in community well-being through investments in education, healthcare, land-based training, uh, cultural and language schools. And so we see a great opportunity here and a great need to ensure that communities can continue to flourish and grow and uh, be included in, in Canada's economy. Just lastly, I'd just like to highlight the Nova Scotia Energy Storage Project. I think it's a really great um, example of where um, Indigenous populations are headed. Um, we've seen uh, investments in with, by Indigenous communities in clean power projects, whether it's transmission or renewable assets across the country over the last couple of decades, actually. Um, and so for us to be able to be a direct lender to the Mi'kmaq nations, represented by WMA in this case, really help to reduce the burden and the cost of capital for those communities who are looking at making an investment. We were able to make the loan directly to the communities, while we also invested in Nova Scotia Power and their project. And so this enabled us to help move that project um, into fruition much faster and uh, ensure that those communities are going to see a reasonable uh, return in the project early and upfront. When we do these investments, we sculpt our repayment of the equity loan so that the communities also see equity distributions early and uh, in upfront in the project. So as soon as equity distributions are being distributed, we sculpt 75% to service our debt while the community is seeing um, you know, equity returns early as we're seeing our repayment profile. And we do that to ensure that communities can see those early returns and they keep and continue to be building their capacity and continue to be invested in the project um, uh, for the long haul. And uh, we think it's a really great way that uh, communities can continue to be involved and prosper economically. Um, and this per project in particular will be uh, the largest energy storage project in Atlantic Canada. Um, and for it to include the land and rights holders of that territory of Nova Scotia is just a tremendous and significant movement in economic reconciliation. And the CIB is so proud to be a part of that. I think that is it for uh, the presentations. And I think, uh, Richard, you'll, I'll pass it back to you. I think you're going to moderate if there's any questions. Thanks, Hillary. And thank you to Hillary, Alex, and Brian for presenting today. That was fascinating, very informative for me. Uh, and I'm sure for those joining online. So as a reminder, I know Annika has mentioned, but please feel free to ask some questions to our presenters using the Q&A function at the top of the, uh, the Teams meeting here. So uh, while these questions come in, Brian, I do have a question for you. Uh, with phase one of the REM now in operations, how is a deal like that, an investment like that, 
able to be replicated in other jurisdictions across Canada? Yeah, we would love to see it replicated across Canada and we'd love to see transit agencies be uh, more open to involving the private sector um, in the procurement and delivery of these these projects where, where it makes sense. Uh, some of the challenges that have prevented that from happening are, are, uh, are really the unwillingness to agree on appropriate uh, model of risk transfer, particularly for large uh, linear infrastructure projects like a LRT project that might span uh, multiple municipalities and, you know, has multiple public and private sector uh, interfaces to worry about. So there's there's certain risks that, you know, the public sector thinks the private sector should take and, and vice versa. And it's really caused some of these projects not to move forward or not to move forward in a, uh, in a way that involves the private sector meaningfully. So, um, you know, and, and to be fair, it's it's not easy to answer for those those risks. Like, who should take that risk? It's it's not uh, it's not a straightforward uh, question to answer. I mean, I think that's an area where uh, the CID can really uh, play a part and potentially uh, fill the the gap that's uh, preventing these projects from moving forward by adding an additional layer layer of capital that can you know not help share or, or take some of these risks or, or, or allow those risks to be shared more easily with the private sector and between the public and private sector. Great, thank you. Uh, Hillary, I see a question here for you. Uh, how do you plan to extend your project portfolio in Canada's north to support the Arctic? It's a great question. In fact, I think when you look at the original map, you don't see a lot of dots in the territories. And that is because the Arctic is a very special place. The three territories are extremely special, um, but there are small populations and infrastructure up there is typically much more expensive to build. And so we have a dedicated team that's working on Indigenous and Northern infrastructure. Um, and we bring in the expertise across the bank in different portfolio and asset classes, but also we bring in uh, private sector to help us to work with the territories, work with Indigenous populations, which really are a large portion of the territorial populations, to um, to expand our network into the Arctic. One of the pieces that I often remind people is that we're the Canada Infrastructure Bank, which does not mean we're the Southern Canada Infrastructure Bank. And so, as you can see from our portfolio, even in the Indigenous spaces, we're making smaller investments, but we're making investments that align with the interests of the regions that we're representing. And that's where um, you know, the Grays Bay Road and Port is a great example of that. Kavalik Hydrofiber Link, these two projects alone will be the first time that Nunavut would actually have a land-based connection to the rest of Canada. That's pretty significant when you think about it. And so, um, you know, we are looking at uh, different opportunities for housing as well across the north. As, as some folks may know, in Nunavut in particular, uh, you know, water and wastewater is not pipes in the ground, it's the Arctic, it's very cold up there. And so water is stored and, and, and it's brought to houses and trucks. And so we're looking at how to modernize and how to upgrade that infrastructure. Again, Nunavut is 100% reliant on diesel. So um, the government of Nunavut is anxious and the three regional economic development and territorial leaders are anxious to look at how to increase its presence of more renewable assets uh, to reduce the reliance on diesel and, you know, be able to have reliable and affordable electricity. So we're really excited about these opportunities and we continue those dialogues with territorial leaders and with Indigenous leaders across the, uh, across the three territories. Great. Thank you, Hillary. Uh, there's a question here that might be towards you, Alex. Uh, we're seeing tightening city budgets and an increase in aging infrastructure. How can the CIB finance infrastructure projects uh, in a way that mitigates pressures on the tax base? Yeah, it's a great question. I think that's an issue that's pretty ubiquitous. It's uh, many municipalities are faced with tightening budgets, and with that comes limited ability to deliver upon the entirety of people's capital plans. Um, it can be hard to be forward looking uh, when you have aging infrastructure. It's, it's daunting to look at expanding infrastructure um, when you're struggling to manage your existing infrastructure. So I think through IHI, the two things that the CIB is offering is um, first of all, loans to all municipalities at a, low, at a rate which is really competitive or below that that they would otherwise be able to obtain. 
Um, and certainly for the smaller medium sized municipalities, that, that, that divide is just going to be that much larger because we're benchmarking it based on the rates of the, the strongest credit rated municipalities in Canada. Um, and secondly, is the risk point. So if there's, it can be daunting to look at your forward looking forecasts of how many homes you expect to be delivered over the next 10, 20, 30 years even, um, and to ensure that that infrastructure that you're building today is paid back by the growing rate base or the growing tax base. And uh, the CIB loan product is, is uh, deliberate in sharing in that risk so that if the growth doesn't pan out as expected, if you never grow, our repayments or our interest rate will never grow. And as a result, um, you're not being left with the, the full, full cost of that infrastructure in the future uh, and the effective interest rate or effective return that the CIB is going to make is going to be far lower than we even projected um, originally. So it, it allows us to encourage municipalities to look forward without, uh, without worrying about, um, to some extent, because it's a risk sharing mechanism, there will still be some cost that is levied by the by the existing rate or tax base, but um, without worrying so much about uh, how how much, how quickly you're going to grow when a lot of these things that affect growth are outside of the municipality's control. Um, Great. Thanks, Alex. We have a question here uh, to Hillary Thatcher. How does CIB utilize the principles of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples including free, prior, and informed consent? I love this question, Raddy. I think it's, um, you know, one of the pieces that I'm most proud about at the bank is um, our commitment to economic reconciliation, but also making sure that as a federal crown corporation that we're not, um, uh, that we're upholding the honor of the crown. Um, and we do this in a way that's quite unique actually from other lenders. So on each and every one of our investments, we actually do an analysis, an Indigenous Matters memo on every single one of our investments to really understand where our investments are located, who are the rights holders of those investments, and how are they being impacted. And in some cases, there may not be a, an impact on Aboriginal and treaty rights, but we want to know that based on advice and counsel with the local nations. We also... Um, uh, we also look at these these as opportunities. So when we're building projects across the country, whether there's Indigenous ownership in the project or not, we look at how are the Indigenous communities benefiting from that infrastructure? Are there, from both an infrastructure perspective, uh, they're getting access to public transit, or um, are there opportunities for procurement on those projects? And so when we undertake an Indigenous Matters Memo, we actually go quite broad to think through what are those impacts how are they being addressed and mitigated? How are the communities being consulted? Um, and you know, what are the opportunities that that infrastructure is going to bring to the community so that we can really ensure that economic reconciliation and just reconciliation with Indigenous communities is being met? So I hope that answers your question. Great. We have a question here for Brian. Uh, with the zero emissions ferry announcement in BC, is there an opportunity for the CIB to invest in other uh, cleaner ferry options in the east of Canada? Uh, yes, we would love to. Uh, it, it requires, uh, um, and we, we do speak to transit agencies uh, in the east as well. Um, and so we, we'd definitely be open to similar projects uh, serving you know, Halifax or even the, uh, I believe the ferries uh, serving the Toronto Island need replacement and they could be uh, replaced with the electric options. We'd love to participate there as well. Great. Uh, there's a question here for you, Hillary. Uh, I'm excited about the new infrastructure investment in Canada, the Canadian North and Arctic region. What other investment opportunities do you envision in these areas? Again, I mentioned earlier some of the housing. There's a significant need for housing in, in the Arctic across the three territories, but also if you look across the north, um, indigenous populations. So housing infrastructure is one. The north also has a high reliance on fossil fuels. So 
as um, as new technology is being developed, we think and we do see and we talk to the regions about the new technology that can help to offset diesel and reduce reliance and potentially in the future eliminate reliance on fossil fuels. The other piece that I wanted to highlight, um, and it's been brought to my attention on a number of occasions, is airports. Uh, landing strips in the Arctic are um, abysmal. They are often gravel runways and too short um, in order to land the new cargo planes. So looking at how we can improve, uh, you know, just all of the trade and transport needs of the Arctic is, uh, you know, there's a, a lot of opportunity here for both public sector investments, but also bringing in private sector expertise. I also just wanted to um, lean on uh, the response that Alex had earlier around municipalities and, and taking on the right approach to risk. It's something we obviously have to do in the Arctic as well, and it does come down to future use. Um, we do know that a lot of the critical minerals are happening in the Arctic um, and in the north in particular. And so as we're looking at multi-purpose uh, assets that would serve a region, a mining region, say the slave geologic region, we might have to take on some risks around future growth and future mines coming on site. The Kavalik Hydrofiber Link is a great example as, of that as well, in that the local population probably won't be, um, you know, they'll be overburdened with the, the from a rate-based perspective to service the type of debt that's going to be incurred with that size and magnitude of a project. And so taking on at the right amount of risk in terms of the future growth and future uh, opportunities is something really important in the North. Great, thank you. Uh, I think this question touches for all of you. Uh, where should I start if I'm looking to work with the CIB on an infrastructure project? Maybe I'll turn it over to Alex first. Sure. Um, short answer is any one of us is a great place to start, but there is a, a more general investments inbox um, where, uh, regardless of the sector that you're interested in, um, an infrastructure project in, you can send it into investments at cib-bic.ca. Um, and a member of the CIB team then effectively filters those and passes them on to um, the right contact people within the bank. So um, your 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 email is not going to get lost if it goes into that inbox. You will get a response. It'll either be from one of us or it'll actually it'll be from um, that coordinator as well. Brian and Hillary, did you have anything to add? You covered it pretty well. Just email Alex and he'll email it to us. I might add that we have a rolling intake. So unlike many of the grant programs that you see across the provinces, territories, federal government, we have a rolling intake. So we're not, um, you know, at, at the right point when the project is at the right stage, you know, reaching out is, is appropriate because we can we can start filtering it through and start doing our diligence and looking at the project and assessing whether it's in mandate early. Um, the other piece that I would say, in addition to the in investments at CIB, we also have an Indigenous at CIB-BIC.ca, and that's specific to Indigenous investments. So again, um, and then lastly, I would add that we have a pretty solid website, if I don't say so myself, and there's a lot of information, a lot of tools there, including um, information around some of our terms, um, some of our uh, programs specific to Indigenous, but also in the housing initiative. So it really has a lot of information there. So you can kind of start having an early gauge as to whether or not your project is, is going to be a fit within our mandate. I'll have one more thing. Sure. And that is, if, if you have existing contacts within the CIB um, that you've spoken to on any number of items, feel free to reach out to them as well. They will probably be able to triage you to the relevant people at the bank, even if it's not in the sector that the they're working in. Um, so yeah, feel free to use who you know or use the more formal inboxes. That's great. And I see Annika has added those emails to the chat. So feel free to mark those down. Uh, we do have a question for Hillary. How will the federal loan guarantee program integrate or interact with existing tools in the marketplace to advance indigenous infrastructure projects? <clears throat> Again, another great, uh, a great question. So currently, um, there's a number of loan guarantee programs across the country. So Ontario started theirs in 2009. The next one started, and that was really focused on uh, 
energy, clean power, renewable generation transmission. The next one started a decade later in Alberta under the Alberta Indigenous Opportunities Corporation. And then following that was Saskatchewan, recently BC announced theirs, and then the federal government has announced theirs. And I hear that there's other jurisdictions looking at loan guarantees as well. These programs are really quite invaluable because what they do is they provide a guarantee to a lender who's going to lend the Indigenous community their equity. So as I talked about what we're doing, we're lending equity directly to that Indigenous hold co. But where there's a guarantee available, it actually can help to reduce the cost of capital again to that Indigenous borrower so that they have access to capital that's affordable so they can make their investments in the project. In some cases, we will work alongside a loan guarantee program uh, so that we can take on some of the risk and the loan guarantee and a private lender will take on the other part of that risk to make sure that the investment is whole. Um, we, uh, in, in other cases, um, a loan guarantee may not be available. It may not be in all jurisdictions. Right now, the federal program has just been announced, so it's going to be under development. Um, you know, there's going to need to be some uh, growth there, but once it is available, I don't uh, see a reason why we wouldn't partner with it if that was needed. Um, and it might just be about the appropriate risk allocation in, in some of those cases or the size of, of the facility, depending on, you know, if this is a multi-billion dollar um, investment, it could be a very large size equity check that's needed. Um, that might be attractive to some private lenders and to some loan guarantees. Some guarantees may suggest that they need to, you know, provide a smaller guarantee and that we fill in the in the gap. So again, we're always a gap filler. So we'll look and we have a very creative, small but innovative team that can help to right size um, any of CIB facility to help get that project built and really ensure that communities are included in the equity opportunities. Great, and Hillary, maybe I'll, I'll just ask you about uh, the project you mentioned in Nova Scotia and the Indigenous equity it provides. Why was it important for the CIB and, and why did the CIB partner with the WMA to move that project forward? Sure, so, you know, equity initiative, our equity initiative is really important in that it enables the communities to make those investments. When communities are owners and operators, participants, equity participants in a project, um, often they're giving the social license in order for that project to happen on their territory. Um, communities have been really quite left out of the of Canada's economy in a big way, um, whether it's in the forestry sector and the mining sector historically, activities happening across their traditional territory where they have rights to the land um, and use and activity on those lands. And so when projects are being built across the territory, and I think this goes a little bit to Raddy's question around the UN Declaration, uh, when there are participants in it, they're providing that social license and they don't take that participation lightly or easy. They consult with their whole community. They ensure that the community supports that investment because they're taking an equity like risk in making those investments. And so they have to weigh that against the returns and against the impacts that the project might be having on their traditional activities or on their lands. And so um, I think that with the WMA, this was such a unique project because it actually encompasses and includes all 13 Mi'kmaq communities in Nova Scotia. So again, that's just so unique that the communities are partnering as one collective in order that all the Mi'kmaq of Nova Scotia will benefit from the economic prosperity that that project will bring. Um, to their their hold code, their Indigenous hold code, which is not, uh, held under um, under the the WMA. Which I apologize if anybody on the call is from WMA. I cannot pronounce that name in Mi'kmaq. It's a very complex word. Um, but it's it's really is about them working together and all benefiting collectively. Um, and I see the uh, I see opportunities, and we're we're in discussions with them on future projects so that there can be collective ownership. If you're not familiar with the Indigenous space, um, Indigenous communities often have overlapping territory as well across the country. So you'll see many communities have, you know, interests in projects because it, the projects, if, especially if it's linear assets, it'll cross multiple territories. And so when communities can come together and work collectively, we often see a lot of great capacity flourishing and other opportunities from a procurement perspective because communities can get 
you know, benefit from, you know, some of the jobs and some of the subcontracts that will happen as well. Um, we also see about a lot of the environmental monitoring and the work undertaking environmental studies be aligned up with the Indigenous um, proponents and, and, and Indigenous supporters of the project. So it really strengthens projects. It, uh, frankly, in my experience over the last, you know, decade and a half, projects get built on time and on budget um, and with social license. So it's it's a it's a it's a great thing when you see projects happening in partnership with communities. Great, thank you, Hillary. Thank you to our presenters today, uh, and for you for joining uh, today's session.